Wow, what a beautiful day. So good to be here with you today at the Paris Church of Christ. I want you to know that if you are a guest with us this morning, for the first time or for a return, we are so honored that you chose to be here today to worship our good God in accordance with his will. And we want you to know that that is why we're here. And if you have any questions or concerns about the way that we have worshipped God this morning, about anything that is said or done, we would be more than happy uh, to sit down and talk with you about what God has said in his word and to learn from you and hopefully to learn together about how we worship and praise our good God. And so, uh, once again, we're so glad that each one is here. If you are a guest and you did not fill out a card uh, from the pew in front of you, especially if you're a first-time guest, I would encourage you strongly to do that. That will help us to help you. Uh, and you can give that to any member uh, before you leave today. <coughs> Last week we began our new series on new beginnings, studying the book of Genesis and how it applies to our life in uh, the 21st century as followers of Christ. And we did that by looking at the very beginning of creation from Genesis chapter 1. And this morning we're going to continue that series by considering the idea that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, looking at Genesis 1 and 2 and the creation of man. If you were with us for the Bible class hour, you've already uh, begun to uh, work on this study. And I hope that uh, all that is said now will help to build up what we studied in the Bible class, but that it won't be merely a repeat for those of you who are here. Wow, hasn't science come a long way? We can do so much, especially uh, I am awed by medical science. We have some doctors in the room. Uh, there's so much that can be done. But even medical science has its limitations. Take a walk with me some 500 years into the future and imagine how far medical science might advance. We're already able to clone individuals. We're able to successfully transplant organs. We can even uh, predetermine eye color and hair color and things like that. And so I don't know how far we may be able to go. But it may come to a point in time when science will say, God, we don't need you. Now, we know that scientists already say that, but uh, play along with me for a moment that we're 500 years in the future and science is able to create a man seemingly from nothing. If in 500 years science were to challenge God to a man-making contest... The scientist comes to God and says, we've come so far, God, we can make a man as well as you can. And God says, all right, well, let's just do it like I did in the good old days with Adam. And the scientist says, okay. So God takes up his scoop full of dirt, and just as he's about to breathe into it the breath of life, he notices in the corner of his eye the scientist grabbing a scoop full of dirt, and he shakes his head, no, he says, whoa, wait a minute, you've got to make your own dirt. <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. You can laugh in church, you know. But isn't the creation of man a wonderful, amazing thing? Isn't it awesome? And as far as we have come, and as far as we could ever go, we could never match the wonder and the power and the ability of God. And it is seen in the creation of man. Turn with me to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. I love this psalm. You know, the psalms are really special. They depict the highs and the lows of life, a, a wide variety and range of emotions, and they provide for us so much material for praising God. And Psalm 8 is a psalm of praise to God. But within that psalm we find a little something about ourselves. I'm going to read with you, beginning in verse 3. 
uh, through verse 8, and then we'll actually look at verse 9 and verse 1. Psalm 8, beginning verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Here David talks about God's creation, including the crowning glory of creation, man. And yet it's not man that he praises in this psalm. It is the God who created man. And so we notice verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And again the refrain, he opens the psalm in verse 1 and concludes it in the same way in verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Brother Eric read for us this morning from Psalm 139 in which we find that God formed us in the womb and we're fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body is amazing. Did you know that your brain produces enough electricity to light a small light bulb? Ounce for ounce your bones are stronger than steel. Your eyes have the capacity to take in over 10 million different shades of color. Isn't the body, the human body, truly amazing and wonderful? I want us to consider this morning the creation of man, how we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I want to do it in three points. And the first point is this. I need to get my... Okay. The first point is this, that we are handmade by God, and His handiwork is evident in us. As we walk through the first chapter of the book of Genesis, we notice certain things that are repeated. We looked at three of those phrases this morning in the Bible class, and the one that is so telling for us this morning is the repetition of the phrase, it was good. God saw that it was good. And in verse 31 of Genesis chapter 1, we notice that God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. At this point, God has created everything, and the crowning jewel of his creation is man. And once he has created all, and the man is created, and he is set in the environment that God established for him, then we see that it is very good. In fact, it is so good that the Bible records not one time, but three different times the creation of man. The first time is in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. It is a general reference to the creation of man. And in that passage, we're told that man is made in God's likeness. He is made after the image of God. Well, what is God's image? What is his likeness? John 4 verse 24 tells us that God is a spirit. And so because we're made in the likeness of God, because we're made in the image of God, we also are spirits first. We are spirits and then we are bodies. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, you are not a body with a spirit, you are a spirit with a body. But the first account of creation is general. It lets us know that man is created in the image of God. The next reference that we see is more specific, and it's in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And this relates specifically to the creation of the man, Adam, the first human. The text says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. It says, The Lord God formed the man of dust, we discussed in the Bible class this morning that when God began creation, 
There is a verb that is used that refer, refers to God creating something from nothing. But here we're told that God formed the man. That Hebrew verb is the same one that is used for a potter with his clay in Isaiah chapter 29, verse 16. So God molds man. He forms him as a potter would take clay and form it and mold it. And we see that again in verse 19, that he does the same with the animals. But man is molded or formed by God. And then the third account is the account of Eve's creation. Verse 20 tells us that for Adam there was not found a helper that was fit for him. Verse 21, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, or better translated, built into a woman and brought her to the man. So we see in chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, the general reference to the creation of man. Then we see in chapter 2, verse 7, the specific reference to the creation of Adam. And now, in chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, the creation of Eve. You know, it's interesting. We're told that Adam is formed like a potter forms clay. We're told that Eve is built. That Hebrew verb, I have to remind myself here, that Hebrew verb is bana. And I always had trouble in Hebrew class memorizing this verb. And so I actually drew on my uh, flashcard a Lego, because this verb refers to building. It implies that there is already a building block in place. And so God makes Eve from Adam, but three times, first a general reference to the creation of the male and the female, the human race, we would say, and then a specific reference to Adam's creation, a forming like a potter molds clay, and then third, Eve's creation, a building, God using the building blocks that he had already created in Adam to make Eve. We are truly the handiwork of God. We are made in his image and in his likeness. But second of all, as God's creation, we are valuable. As God's creation, we are valuable. You know, God doesn't make junk. Humans, we make junk. I suppose if I were to come to any of your houses and say, find me a piece of junk, most of us would have no problem doing just that. Just ask my wife. I'm a collector of junk. You don't know how much junk she's made me throw away in the one year that we've been married. And she's still working on me. But we've all got some junk. It's man-made stuff. You know, I sometimes wondered, who created those old can openers? Maybe the cans have just changed. But when I was living in Henderson, Tennessee, I had one of those old metal can openers. And that thing wouldn't open a can for anything. And I thought, what a piece of junk. You know, it went in the yard sale pile as soon as uh, we got some things when we got married. We got some better quality things. Just take a look at the old Ford Fiesta. Anybody remember them? What a piece of junk, right? People make junk from time to time. Occasionally we, we get it right. But even then, things tend to wear out pretty quickly, don't they? They're constantly having to be updated and changed. Over 5,000 years ago, God made man. And he hasn't had to change him one bit. The original design is still relevant and functional. Because God doesn't make junk. And so we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, And God blessed them, okay? And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. See, God made man in his image, and he made us well, he made us so well, in fact, that we're worth being duplicated. And so he tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. In fact, we're so valuable to God because we're made in his image that he has a special respect 
for life. We see this in Genesis 1, 28. We also see it in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, after Adam and Eve have been expelled from the garden, they have some sons, and you know that Cain kills Abel. And in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10, the Lord says to Cain, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me. It's crying to me from the ground. Why was the voice of Abel's blood crying out to God? Because he values life. We see it in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, both the fifth commandment and the sixth commandment deal especially with God's value of life. The fifth commandment says, Honor your father and your mother, Exodus 20 verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. God values life. He doesn't want to see it snuffed out. And then verse 13, you shall not murder. You shall not take life. God values life because he created it. Because he created us in his image. And therefore we are valuable. And we see it in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 25. The Lord says, Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And all the people shall say, Amen. Because we're created in the image of God. We're valuable. We have life within us because God breathed it into us. One of the most unfortunate and atrocious and heinous aspects of our culture in this country is a basic devaluing of life. We can see it in at least three ways in our culture. The first way is the taking of innocent life. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, it's not my favorite thing to talk about cultural trends. You know the thing about trends? They come and they go. But abortion has been around in this country for far too long. One day is too long. It is a devaluing of life. It is a smack in the face of the God who gives life. Now, I know in a room of this size, there could be someone who's had an abortion. You know what? God loves you. He can forgive you. He will forgive you. But like Jesus told the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 7 through John chapter 8, go and sin no more. Please value life. We see that life is being devalued every day through the practice of abortion. We also see it in the way that we have disrespected and failed to care for our elderly. You know, it's really sad but our culture does not respect age very much anymore. The fifth commandment says, Honor your father and your mother. God values life. He values the young, innocent life. He values the aged who have seen and experienced many things in the world. And God also values each individual life. And one thing that we see as a basic devaluing of life is the way that we abuse the bodies that he's given us. You know, he created us in his image. And yet we do awful things to our body. Some of us, I'm guilty from time to time, are just flat out lazy. And we just let this magnificent tool, this magnificent, incredible machine that is capable of so much, lay to waste. And some of us can't control our appetites. Some of us eat unhealthy food and we eat far too often. That is a devaluing of life when we don't treat this body with respect. Some of us take drugs or smoke, whatever it may be. That is a devaluing of life. And we see it prevalently in our culture. Do whatever you want, whatever feels good right now in the moment. Don't worry about how it's going to feel later on. But God values life. And then we finally see this. First, we are the creations of God. His handiwork is evident in us. Second, 
because we are God's creation, we are valuable. And third, God created us for a purpose. God created us for a purpose. You know, God created Adam for a specific purpose. Look at Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, and here it is, to work it and keep it. God made Adam to be a steward of creation, to work the creation and to keep the creation. He also made Eve for a purpose. He made her to be a helper fit for Adam, to be a counterpart to Adam. They were equal halves made to be together, to work together. They were made for one another because verse 20 says that up until the point that Eve is created, there was not a helper fit for Adam. But God also made each and every one of us for a purpose. You know, it's interesting. Man started out as a good being. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, we read that God saw all that he had created, including mankind, and he said it was very good. But look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. The Lord commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Up until the point that Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree, they were good. And everything they did was innocent and pure and good. But in the moment that they took the fruit, part of their goodness was lost. But God created us to be good. He didn't create us to be bad. He didn't create us to do wrong. He created us to do good. But he gave us the ability to choose. He didn't give that ability to the animals. He didn't give that ability to anyone but to us. When we are born again, talking about new beginnings this quarter, when we're born again in Jesus Christ, when we die to our old self, when we're buried in the waters of baptism, God creates us anew, and again we are created for good works, just as it was in the garden. So we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, this. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, God didn't create the animals to do good or to be good or to do wrong or to be bad. You know, one day the zookeeper, he was checking all of the animals in the zoo, and he came upon the chimpanzee. And the chimpanzee was reading in one hand the Bible, and in the other hand he was reading Darwin's Origin of the Species. And the zookeeper said to the primate, what you doing there, bud? He said, well, I was just reading up. See, I wanted to know if I was my brother's keeper or my keeper's brother. <laughs> God did not create the animals in such a way that they can discern right from wrong. But he created us magnificently, wonderfully. He created us. And he created us for good works. Did you know there are nearly 30 bones in the human hand? There are four nerves that go into the human hand, feeding some 2,500 nerve endings per square centimeter of your hand. I couldn't find the exact number of muscles, but the hand is an extremely amazing tool that God has given us. It is extremely complex. 
And the brain is as well. I'm going to have to read this because I don't know all this terminology. But in 2013, scientists from Japan and Germany were able to simulate 1%, 1% of human brain activity for one second using 82,000 processors from the fourth most powerful supercomputer in the world. It took 82,000 processors of an extremely powerful computer to produce 1% of the human brain's capability for one second. Now we are made awesomely. We are made fearfully and wonderfully. By the way, what does that word fearfully mean? We are made fearfully. You know, the word fearfully means that something is frightening in its action or doing. God made us fearfully. We are so intricate. We are so complex. The design of the human body is so mind-boggling that it's frightening. That's what that means. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are handmade by God, made in His image, after His likeness, And his work is evident in us. Because we are made by God and he breathed life into us, each one of us is valuable. And we've been given a purpose. We were created by God to do good works. And we can do good works when we're recreated in Jesus Christ. The final scripture that I want to share with you is from Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. Romans 6, verse 13. This amazing, wonderful body God has given you. You have a choice. To use it for His glory or to use it for yourself. Romans 6, 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. And another translation says this, So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. How are you using this amazing body that God has given you? If you're not using it for His glory, you have an opportunity to be created again in Jesus Christ for good works. Hearing the gospel that Jesus is the Son of God, believing that message, turning away from your life of sin, He will create you anew in the waters of baptism as you die to self. You rise to walk a new life, and you walk in these good works. Or if you're already a Christian, you've already done those things, and you're not using this fearfully, wonderfully made instrument for God's glory, rededicate yourself to Him this morning as we stand and sing this song together.